This is episode four. I'm going back to C.S. Lewis. I'm going to be talking about Surprised by Joy, um, which is sort of an autobiography about um, his childhood, um, I guess sort of up to his conversion. Um, So this is one of my favorite C.S. Lewis books. Um, I've read it many times. I'll probably read it for the rest of my life. It's just a great book that I love to go back to. Um, I'm just going to read some quotes from it. Um, and then I can sort of get into what he talks about. And... Um, In some of my other videos, I've talked about my affection for Lewis. Um, and this book is, I guess, just another example of why I think he's such a good writer. Because his life was completely different than mine. <laughs> he grew up in a, another country. He was over in England. Um, his mother died when he was young. Um, he excelled in um, education. Um, I really couldn't stand my education, but <laughs> he was actually going to private school and um, I went to public school and um, that could have a lot to do with it. But um, it's that old adage that we read to know that we're not alone and um, he's just great at um, being able to relate to what he went through and being able to um, compare that with what I went through as I was growing up. So let's dig in. Here's the first quote I want to read to you. It's about, uh, there's a couple quotes here where he's comparing his um, mother's family and his father's family. And the Hamiltons were his mother's family, and here's what he has to say about them. The Hamiltons were a cooler race. Their minds were critical and ironic, and they had the talent for happiness in a high degree. Went straight for it, as experienced travelers go for the best seat in a train. That part about uh, the talent for happiness. Um, and how they went for it as experienced travelers go for a train. That's such a great analogy. And I've known people like this, and I appreciate people like this, because <laughs> I do not have the talent for happiness. Um, but I can certainly um, see it in others. And I just thought that was a great way to put it. His dad's family was much more um, emotional and, um, you know, a little bit more of a roller coaster. Um, so he talks a lot in the book about how once his mother dies, his relationship with his dad is pretty tumultuous. Um, so anyway, here's another quote. For my earliest years, I was aware of the vivid contrast between my mother's cheerful and tranquil affection and the ups and downs of my father's emotional life. And this bred in me long before I was old enough to give it a name. A certain distrust or dislike of emotion as something uncomfortable and embarrassing and even dangerous. I don't know where my... I might just be naturally not very emotional. Um, you know, and it could have something to do with my upbringing or... Um, you know, who's to say? And maybe if I thought about it, I could come up with <laughs> a source as he sort of found one for himself. But um, definitely something I can relate to. I see the value of emotion. I mean, I really do. Um, it just seems like they're so often untrustworthy. And <laughs> figuring out how 
your emotions work together with your logic and rationality and all of the other things about your own personality and those around you and everything else that's going on in the world that's very difficult balance to strike um, I won't talk too much um, about Lewis's mom's death um, he writes about it beautifully and um, he was young so I don't think he remembers that much about it but um, here's one of his quotes about the funeral <clears throat> to my hatred for what I had already felt to be all the fuss and flummery of the funeral, I may perhaps trace something in me which I now recognize as a defect by which I have never fully, f never fully overcome. A distaste for all that is public, all that belongs to the collective, a boorish inaptitude for formality. There's a typo in there, so I kind of read it wrong, but... A distaste for all that is public, all that belongs to the collective, a boorish inaptitude for formality. Um, once again, just beautifully written. Um, I can see why we have funerals, and I can see why those are important and meaningful and all that stuff. But what I relate to that Lewis is sort of alluding to here is... Um, think maybe it's important to remind ourselves that they're not they're inadequate maybe they're the best we can do and maybe we should be trying to do better but um, the meaning of that moment um, is not fully conveyed in that service and um, I don't think that's exactly what his quote is saying, but I think what his quote is saying is um, his dislike of those moments um, it is because they're inadequate. Um, hope I said that well enough. So I, this is one of my, well, all of these are my favorite. That's why I'm telling you to, telling them to you, but this is the last line of the chapter where he's talking about his mother's death. With my mother's death, all settled happiness, all that was tranquil and reliable disappeared from my life. There was to be much fun, many pleasures, many steps of joy, but no more of the old security. It was sea and islands now. The great continent had sunk like Atlantis. For everyone who's been through something dramatic and maybe especially as a young kid um, I hope they can relate to that like I um, can one of my parents didn't die but um, my parents split up and what I would always say is um, nothing was safe anymore you kind of grow up with um, you're aware of this sort of unit that is your family before you even know what it is and you did not until it's gone do you realize how much you relied on that for your identity and to feel secure and all that stuff um, so I just thought that's another beautiful analogy it was sea and islands now the great continent had sunk like Atlantis <clears throat> All right, so the next quote is I made it a rigid rule that at social functions, as I secretly called them, I must never on any account speak of any subject in which I felt the slightest interest, nor in any words that naturally occurred to me. And I kept my rule only too well, a giggling and gurgling imitation of the vapidest grown-up chatter, a deliberate concealment of all that I really thought and felt under a sort of feeble jocularity and enthusiasm. 
was henceforth my party manner. <clears throat> assumed as consciously as an actor assumes his role, sustained with unspeakable weariness, and dropped with a groan of relief the moment my brother and I at last tumbled into our cab in the drive home. The only pleasure of the evening. I think I've lived most of my life this way. Um, I think I've gotten old, as I've gotten older, I've, um, <laughs> I'm venturing out a little bit more and maybe having a little more success at finding people who share my interests, but, um, It's a tough realization to realize that um, the things you're naturally drawn to are not the things that most people are naturally drawn to. And um, with classmates and friends and social gatherings, um, the pressure to conform or just fit in or make friends or, um, you know, all those things are natural. Um, but I just, I really like the way he <coughs> uh, described it in his own life, um, because it's just something I so relate to. Um, most of us can't do it forever, and we end up, um, whether we're walking away from friends or, um, you know, just spending more time in solitude or... Um, it's a balancing act for sure I mean for those of us who have families and um, you know it can be seen as very selfish and um, it's it's just a balance that each of us kind of have to figure out this is sort of another line about solitude um, in one of the schools he was going to, he, uh, let me talk a little bit more about his school before I read this next quote, because he talks about several, um, several of the schools he went to. You know, most of us, at least the American audience, if there is a typical, you know, we probably went to public school and if our parents moved around or, you know, maybe we went to a few, um, but he went to several schools and moved around for different reasons and, um, just being taught privately just, it sounds like such a completely different world than what most of us experienced. Um, so that's a fun read just to read. Um, what he went through, and obviously he became a writer, and um, he was a professor at Cambridge, I think, as well. Um, so, um, you know, that was his element, and obviously he excelled in it, but uh, that's just a very interesting aspect of the book. So this quote is from, um, he got sick, um, so sick that he had to leave school. And so he had this small pocket where um, his brother was off at school and he was, um, it was just him and his dad. And it was one of the few times in his life where he was getting along well with his dad. Um, but then there's this quote about when he was home alone, and it goes, And in the days when he was out, I entered with complete satisfaction into a deeper solitude than I had ever known. The empty house, the empty silent rooms were like a refreshing bath after the crowded noise of Campbell, which was the school I went to. I could read, write, and draw to my heart's content. Being able to enjoy solitude that way, yeah. It's also something that I really relate to. Um, I don't think my silent time was nearly as productive as his. Um, 
I think that's certainly one of the challenges of my life is figuring out what to do with it and why I enjoy it. Um, <coughs> so that's sort of an ongoing thing for me, but um, I definitely related to that. Um, this is a quick quote. Uh, it's since the book is called Surprised by Joy. Um, I wanted to talk about what he's talking about when he is speaking of joy. So here's the quote. All joy reminds it is never a possession, always a desire for something longer ago or further away or still about to be. Um, so sort of this... Um, you know, it's just sort of an autobiography of his young life, but it's also sort of about his conversion to Christianity. And um, he kind of spent <coughs> part of his childhood as a believer, and then he would walk away from it um, for a long time, and then he ended up coming back to it. Um, but this joy that he's talking about is just sort of this longing. Um, and he talks about this in several of his books, but, you know, it can come from a song, it can come from a landscape, it can come from a movie you saw or a book that you read. Um, and sort of the idea is, because he studied it, because, you know, once he felt that, he was trying to recreate it and trying to figure out where it came from. And his conclusion was that um, it wasn't in the book you read or it wasn't in the landscape. It was just something that sort of awakened something in you, um, which is why that this quote says, you know, longer ago or further away or still about to be. Um, some people listening to this may have no idea what that means, but, um, I think a good number of people have felt that before, um, for, you know, any of the examples I gave or, you know, there could be others, but, um, so that's part of the book that he kind of weaves through all of it is, um, you know, I think by the end of the book, he sort of reconciled that, um, that longing was, um, in a very generic way, you could say it was a longing for God, but, um, obviously there's more to it than that. Um, here's a quote about, um, at one of the schools, um, and this is that he's, get, he's getting older and, you know, this is when things start to get clicky and there's social things and there's um, <coughs> activities that everyone has to partake in and um, even if you're not interested in them, you have to act like you're interested in them. And um, So... Here's one of the quotes. Is, I think that this feigning, this ceaseless pretense of interest in matters to me supremely boring was what wore me out more than anything else. Certainly related to that, too. Um, you know, the clickiness of school. Um, feeling like I was missing out if I wasn't at a social activity or... Um, people that were popular so I was supposed to like even though I thought they were complete pieces of shit I mean uh, you know all of that stuff I get sort of tired even thinking about it but here's one more quote that he has about school for a boy goes to a public school precisely to be made a normal sensible boy a good mixer to be taken out of himself and eccentricity is severely penalized. I guess that's just sort of a continuation of all of the things we've been talking about. 
you know, solitude is sort of the opposite of that. <laughs> solitude is sort of indulging in your eccentricities and, um, you know, as I said, there's a balance to be struck there. Um, I just get the sense that historically we have probably went too far in the direction of the collective and not enough in the direction of the individual. I think this next quote is uh, it was kind of a moment or maybe a sort of a transition where um, he was reading way over his head when he was younger and um, when he would share what he was reading with other people it became clear to him that they thought he was bragging um, and, you know, it sort of goes back to that quote earlier about him realizing that he couldn't share what he was really interested in. But this was sort of even worse than that, because by him doing that, they thought he was bragging or, you know, showing off or whatever. So what is... I could not help knowing that most other people, boys and grown-ups alike, did not care for the books I read. Um, and then a little further down on that page, it says, A certain shame or bashfulness attached itself to whatever one deeply and privately enjoyed. I went to the call, which is another name for another school I went to. I went to the call far more disposed to excuse my literary taste than to plume myself on them. <clears throat> Um, so that was sort of the first step where he was sort of horrified to realize that people thought he was showing off but then there came a step where he actually did become arrogant where um, something along the lines of you realize that you have developed taste or you have <clears throat> the your ability to enjoy something that um, the riffraff cannot. Um, obviously, there's temptation there for that to make you arrogant. Um, so a couple more quotes about that whole process. Is, one of them is, the moment good taste knows itself, some of its goodness is lost. Even then, however, it is not necessary to take the further downward step of defies, despising the Philistines who do not share it. And then, uh, where oppression does not completely and permanently break the spirit, has it not a natural tendency to produce retaliatory pride and contempt? So I just think he writes very well about, in a way that I could certainly relate to, about um, fitting in, following your own passions, um, and, you know, call it the arts, call it, um, you know, there's sort of that age-old debate about whether art is subjective or, you know, is good art objective, is good music objective, or good films objective. And that's part of the debate, but there's also this debate about, well, it's not even a debate, but it's sort of that collective um, versus the individual idea of just being able to follow whatever it is you're interested in without having to feel ashamed or, um, you know, there's just a whole lot to it. Um, and as a society, obviously, we, I don't think we figured it out yet. <coughs> and there's probably a pretty good argument to be made that um, 
our tastes are getting worse and or um, the quality of art that we're making is getting worse or maybe it's all related but um, hopefully we have it in us to correct that some way somehow so one one of the things about this book that just blew me away was he talks about pederasty in these schools um, basically the older boys um, having sexual relationships with um, the younger boys I think he called them poffs or something like that um, Obviously, it was another time. It was another country. And we've all heard about these stories. And, um, you know, obviously, the Catholics have gotten in all sorts of trouble for this sort of thing. Um, so, obviously, I know it's around. I've just never... I didn't go to Catholic school or church. And I... I've just never really been around it. So when he writes about it like this is sort of a understood thing. It was it just sort of blew me away. Um, I don't think he outright says whether he he doesn't make it sound like he that was much really a part of his um, experience. Um, no, did he escape it completely? Uh, it doesn't really say that either, but um, it certainly sounded like it was, you know, there was a good chance you could avoid it if, you know, that wasn't your thing. But anyway, one of the quotes that he um, says in that portion is, Plato was right after all. Eros, turned upside down, blackened, distorted, and filthy, still bore the traces of his divinity. And sort of the point he's making is, um, in those relationships, he said that was some of the only kindness that he saw in, um, his experience at that school, because it was so competitive and, you know, clicky and all the things that I've been talking about, um, so this was sort of a, I guess, perverted, twisted. Um, but obviously there was some affection involved in doing favors for, um, I don't know, reciprocating because of these relationships. or um, Obviously it's an odd thing to talk about, but... Um, I guess I at least saw his point. Here's another quote about his education, or education in general. The greatest service we can do to education today is to teach fewer subjects. No one has time to do more than a very few things well before he is 20, and when we force a boy to be a mediocrity in a dozen subjects, we destroy his standards, perhaps for life. that always really struck out stuck out to me because I always struggled with school I mean my grades were okay and I just I always fought this notion that it was such a waste of time and I never really felt like I had good teachers and I don't think I was a good student either I mean I was kind of a punk and a rebel and um, I certainly didn't make it easy on them but I just, I'm a little jealous now when I hear people talking about having a good education because I, <clears throat> I don't know what I could have done to improve my own education, but um, <laughs> it just, but this idea of doing too many things, um, and I, I, I certainly felt that in college. I mean, so many classes I took were just a joke. It was just a hoop that I had to jump through to finish my degree, so.
Here's a quote about um, nothing. Sorry, this is a quote about friends or meeting people like yourself. Nothing, I suspect, is more astonishing in any man's life than this discovery that there do exist people very, very like himself. Um, I'm kind of jealous in, of him in this because um, he seemed to be able to do this better than I've been able to do it. I don't want to disparage the friends I've had in my life, and I've certainly had good friends, and um, you know, but when Lewis talks about friendship, he talks about a very specific type of friendship, and um, in his <coughs> book called The Four Loves, he um, writes a whole big section just about friendship, and um, I mean, it's great to read, but <laughs> unfortunately, I think it kind of ruined <laughs> me finding friends, because it, it's almost like my standards are... Um, unrealistically high um, I hope that doesn't sound arrogant I hope that comes across that you know, that's a fault of mine um, you know I had all the struggles that he had of feeling like being myself was not very welcome in my environment um, it just seems like he's done a much better he did a much better job of figuring out how to find an outlet for that. Um, this is a quote about one of his teachers um, that I liked a lot. We were talking about emotion before, and <laughs> this guy's kind of like the polar opposite of that. Um, so I really appreciated this. If ever a man came near to being a purely logical entity, that man was Kirk. Born a little later, he would have been a logical positivist. I'm not really sure what that is. The idea that human beings should exercise the vo their vocal organs for any purpose except that of communicating or discovering truth was to him preposterous. I've sort of been around people like this, and they can kind of drive you crazy after a while. Um, but there's also something very... Um, likable and dependable and um, it can be a really good quality um, it can go wrong all sorts of ways but um, I just like that quote <laughs> he uh... oh, here's one more how rightly Sir Maurice Poick says I'm sure I butchered that last name. How rightly Sir Maurice Poick says, there have been civilized people in all ages, and let us add, in all ages they have been surrounded by barbarism. In these crazy times we're living in, um, I guess I hope he's right. Um, and Maybe it's on us civilized people to sort of find each other and <clears throat> coordinate our efforts a little bit in trying to improve things because it seems like things are getting pretty bad. This is a quote that um, he found this, I think it was after his dad died, in one of the letters between him and one of his teachers. Um, and this is what the teacher wrote about him. He said, you may make a writer or a scholar of him, but you'll not make anything else. You make up your mind to that. And I knew this myself. Sometimes it terrified me. <laughs> I so related to that. Um, I kind of wish somebody had seen um, a talent in me that I could... Um, Excel in because I, I think I'm still trying to figure that out. But, um, feeling like I have a very limited skill set 
and maybe there's some things that I could be very good at, but um, figuring out a place for me and figuring out where I can exercise those um, and that has terrified me my whole life um, as well. So definitely something I relate to. The last quote is kind of right at the end of the book when he talks about um, you know there's sort of a build up to the end of the book as his um, atheism starts being challenged by authors that he comes across and friends that he makes and um, you know he kind of goes through what you know the milestones of how he came around um, but this is sort of the culmination of that um, you must picture me alone in that room in Magdalene night after night feeling whenever my mind lifted even for a second from my work the steady unrelenting approach of him who I, whom I so earnestly desired not to meet that which I greatly feared had at last come upon me. In the Trinity term of 1929, I gave in and admitted that God was God and knelt and prayed, perhaps that night the most dejected and reluctant convert in all England. I did not see then what is now the most shining and obvious thing, the divine, the divine humility which will accept a convert even on such terms. The prodigal son at least walked home on his own feet, but who can duly adore who is brought in kicking, struggling, resentful, and darting his eyes in every direction for a chance of escape? The words in Latin that I... Anyway, I'll give it a shot. The words compella intrare, compel them to come in, have been so abused by wicked men that we shudder at them, but properly understood they plumb the depth of the divine mercy. The hardness of God is kinder than the softest of men, and his compulsion is our liberation. I should probably look up that Latin and see what the significance of it is. Um, there seems a lot of depth in what he's saying about the hardness of God is kinder than the softness of men, and his compulsion is our liberation. I kind of understand that, but I don't feel like I completely understand it, so, but it sounds really cool. Um, my conversion was really nothing like this, but um, I just think it's beautifully written. Um, there's just... I don't know. <laughs> if you're if you're a believer, maybe that strikes a chord with you. And even if it doesn't, that's okay. Um, I've had to come to the realization that C.S. Lewis isn't for everybody. Um, you know, as we've talked about, <laughs> we all have different tastes, and you know, so be it. So. Um, I guess I'll just leave it at that. But uh, since his conversion was so different than mine, um, that's probably the least interesting um, part of the book. I mean, his education was so interesting. And I didn't even talk about when he goes to the war, but um, that's also very interesting too. He talks about his time in the war and he was actually wounded. Um, I think he might have even been given a medal for that. Um, but he just sort of laughs at it because um, he calls it dumb luck or something similar to that where <laughs> he was certainly not being heroic. He just happened to bumble into something. So, um, so there's a few of his books where he talks about that, and it's always interesting to hear him talk about that. Um, but, you know, I definitely relate to this joy that he alludes to in the title. And, um, 
you know, the longing he talks about, I, something I could really relate to. And um, it's also an odd coincidence that he would end up marrying much later in life. He married a woman named Joy. So a funny little coincidence there as well. So anyway, um, that's a flavor of why I love this book so much. Onward and upward. Thanks for listening.